Uh, it's 5.30. Thank you guys for showing up this evening, for sticking with us. This is our, gosh, 12th or 13th webinar. We've got uh, one more that we're going to do next week, and we're going to kind of wrap up this season. So this will be the second to last one that we're going to do here for now. Um, what we wanted to do this week was kind of talk about some of the frequently asked questions that we get, some that, you know, wouldn't constitute doing a whole webinar for, but are just kind of quick hitters that we can answer within three to five minutes. Uh, so I do have a pretty long list of questions as a sales team that we kind of put together on what we get asked the most. But if you guys have questions that we don't cover, we will leave some time at the end for you guys to ask those in the chat bar. So go ahead. If you're also watching on Facebook, you can comment on Facebook as well. And I'll try to get to those um, so that Keith and Dale can answer that. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of kick us right off. Um, what I'll probably do is, again, we're going to jump all over tonight just because we're going to hit a lot of different topics. So one of the first things we're going to hit is more of the logistics side of green cover seed. Um, one of the big questions we get is, do you guys work with the small guys? So uh, Keith and Dale, um, thanks for joining us tonight. Why don't you guys start off with how do we work with the small guy? <laughs> Well, first of all, Noah, there, there are no small soil health people, only small problems to solve, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, we, we, uh, we I, I, maybe it's wrong to be prideful, but we do kind of take pride in the fact that we do work with everybody. Uh, we have uh, an online presence, our internet store, we call it the smart store. Uh, we sell one pound of seed at a time to people all the time. And it, that's probably best handled on this on the smart store. You can get on greencoverseed.com and you can order one pound of anything that you want. And uh, we'll ship that right out to you. You can handle the payment and everything right online doing that. Uh, so, so that may take care of some of what you're wanting to do if you're a smaller, you know, have smaller needs. We do also have some pre-made mixes. We, we tend to not necessarily encourage a lot of that because we do like to customize mixes for the individual customers needs but you know if you have a garden and just have a half an acre or a little parcel you know you don't need a whole acres worth of a mix so then we do have i don't know what do we have 10 or 12 different pre-made mixes and we make those available you can buy those in as small as one pound quantities as well and so that that will help take care of a lot of the gardeners and then uh, we do on our smart mix calculator, we do have a one acre minimum on the smart mix calculator because it's just a lot of work to do that. And we just can't afford to do that for three, a 300 square foot parcel. So that's why we do have those other ones, but you, you can make one acre mixes on the smart mix calculator and uh, we will mix that up according to your specifications and requirements and, and send that out. So yes, we work with uh, uh, people of all uh, varying backgrounds and sizes and uh, you know try to give uh, you know as good a customer service as we can to everybody so uh, Dale do you want to make any comments on that no I uh, I think you covered it pretty well yeah and one of the questions this isn't on my list but that I get a lot is can I order additional seed and how long will that store so I do have people that will order extra seed to meet that uh, one acre minimum and they'll use that same seed for yeah. a year. How, how long do you guys typically say that the seed would last on a, on a mix? All depends on how you store it. You know, if you've got a relatively small amount of seed, you know, keeping it cool, um, even putting it in the freezer, uh, you know, the, the, the seed warehouses, you know, where they're keeping the seed library of the world. Uh, I mean, those are in cold storage. Uh, so the cooler you can keep it, the longer it will last. But even if you, you know, the main thing is keep the mice out of it. Uh, so put it in some sort of a sealed plastic container, keep it out of the sun, keep it in your house so it stays cool. Uh, one little trick that you can do is get a little bit of diametaceous earth and sprinkle in your seed mix. And that will keep bugs from coming in there because it, it's a really good natural bug deterrent. Uh, it's not a chemical. Uh, it's a very powderized uh fossil shells and so it really deters insects so if you're going to do long-term storage uh, look for a little bit of diatomaceous earth to put in there keep it sealed up keep it dry keep it cool and uh, you know a year easy two years three years 
Um, you know, I've seen tests on some of the brassicas, radishes, turnips, things like that, that five, six years out, they're still over 90% germ. Not everything will do that. Um, I wouldn't, as a general rule, I wouldn't encourage people to store stuff more than a couple of years. And then only if you're really got it sealed up good. Yeah, and, and diatomaceous earth is, is actually fairly easy to come by. Um, there's a lot of brand names. Um, a lot of your um, household uh, insecticides, not, not like Raid, the stuff you spray, but the insecticide powders that you might put in the house, the active ingredient for some of those uh, are our diatomaceous earth. Yeah, and we actually have that on hand. Label. If, if you're wanting to store something long-term, ask us, we can probably throw a little bit of that in for you too. So speaking of throwing a little bit of that in, do we uh, often get the question, do we pre-inoculate everything that we have in our mixes? So how do we handle inoculant? Yeah, that's always a good question. Um, we, we, we do pre-inoculate some things, other things we're hesitant to do that on. A lot of that depends on number one, what it is, and number two, how long it's going to be before you plant. So there's, there's quite a spectrum of how viable inoculants are, all the way from like our clovers and alfalfa that we inoculate. That inoculant, it's, it's, it's encapsulated in clay. That stuff's good for 18 months on the seed. That's what the label says, very long lasting. So we, we are, you know, we're pre-coating that and, and it's not really a coating, it's just a dry powder, but it's clay based. And so that stuff lasts for a long, long time. The other end of that extreme is the P. lentil vetch bacteria. It is, it is very wimpy. It does not last very long. And so uh, we're, we're more hesitant to put that on the seed if you're telling us it's gonna be uh, very long before you get it in the ground. Uh, we do have some products that have some extenders in it that will extend the life of that P. lentil vetch bacteria. And so we can stretch that out a little bit longer. Uh, the cow pea type is a little more hardy than the P. lentil vetch. And then the soybean rhizobia uh, are very hardy. Yeah, they'll they'll last for several weeks on the seed. So, um, so it kind of depends again on what you're doing, uh, how long it's going to be. If it's the cool part of the year, they'll last much longer than if it's the hot part of the year. And so, we'll try to work with the customer and find out if we know that it's going to be several weeks before they plant. We'll really encourage them to not mix it in, uh, but to ship it on the side. And then sometimes what I'll do, uh, you know, to kind of you know, play both sides of it a little bit. We'll mix some in because the, the inoculants that have the extenders in them also cost more. And so I'll maybe mix in a partial rate of that and then send some of the cheaper stuff still sealed up in the bag along with the seed and have the customer put that on as they're going into the drill. And so there's some that's mixed in and there's some that's not. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there a little bit. Uh, so that kind of covers the rhizobia. Dale, why don't you talk a little bit about the Biazo and the Mycorrhiza because they're, they're a little bit different okay. products and maybe even the, the Hypergrow compost extract too. Sure. Um, the uh, the Biazo is, is, is a blend of Azotobacter and Azospirillum, which are free living nitrogen fixers. They can fix nitrogen on the roots of sorghum, corn, millets, uh, basically just about any plant uh, that has root exudates, which is, I believe, all of them. Just about all, yeah. Can, can feed uh, azospirillum and azotobacter, but it, they, it really thrives on warm season grasses because those are really high root exudate producing organisms or uh, plants that can nourish these organisms. Um, they don't fix a lot of nitrogen, but uh, in a grass legume mix where you're not putting nitrogen fertilizer out there, every little additional bit counts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I, I really have seen some, some good results from. Um, longevity on seed of the Biazo, uh, label says about 30 days. It's, it's more hardy than most of our rhizobium bacteria, you know, that are peat based type rhizobium which, you know, might last, you know, a week, depending on the organism. Um, Biazo is definitely hardier than that. But again, it's, it's a living organism. As soon as we break the bag, it starts dying. 
So uh, even even though it's hardier than than the rhizobium bacteria, uh, we still want to see you get it in the ground on fairly timely manner. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi, on the other hand, uh, those spores, I mean, they have a hard capsule on them. They are very persistent. They can last a couple of years on the seed uh, with basically no loss of viability. And then they'll lose about 10% viability every year after that. Um, the first mycorrhizal fungi I ever inoculated with was five-year-old product and it worked fantastic. And I, um, I mean, if, if it hadn't worked, I wouldn't be pitching it now today. That's what started my whole journey is someone gave me some stuff for free because it was expired. And anybody that knows me knows I'm one of the, the biggest cheapskates on the planet. And uh, that is true. <laughs> free speaks to me. And um, so, yeah, um, so yeah, I'll try it if it's free. I, I know a lot about mycorrhizal fungi, but. I, I didn't want to pay for it, and I'm, I'm sure glad I got that material uh, because it, it was very impressive, and boom. I mean, results within 30, 60 days, there was just a noticeable difference. So mycorrhizal fungi is very, very uh, durable. It, it Unlike rhizobium, you know, Keith was talking about temperature. Um, ultraviolet light kills rhizobium. Temperatures over about 110, 120 degrees kill rhizobium. And, and, you know, so they're pretty fragile. Mycorrhizal fungi, on the other hand, those spores can take up to 140 degrees. Um, they can take direct sunlight. They can even take fertilizer contact. You can mix it with fertilizer, and which is and another weird thing, you can actually mix it with fungicide and it won't kill those spores because it doesn't penetrate that shell. Um, not advisable, but it can handle it. So um, the mycorrhizal fungi, you can spread it on the soil surface. It can sit there in the sun for a year and you catch a rain, work it in the ground. It's still good. So it's uh, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, they're tough. Tough product, yeah. Okay. Hey. On, on our seed and on those inoculants, are those organic? Do we have organic seed is something that we get quite often. Mm. Yeah, we get that question a lot. We do work with a lot of organic uh, growers. I'm happy to do that. It seems like, and I would say there's more and more all the time. I think more people are transitioning to that. Uh, our seed is not certified organic. Uh, it's just, it's too hard to come by. And if you don't have all organic seed for your mix, then you just as well not have any because uh, there's not gonna make the certifier happy. So the way the Organic Standards Act reads for those organic growers, if they've looked three places and they can't find certified organic seed for that cover crop, uh, they are allowed to use seed that is non-GMO and non-treated. And so we have all non-GMO seed and I would say that 98% of all of our seed is untreated as well. Once in a while, we'll get a treated sorghum in because that's the only way we can get it, especially late in the year. Uh, so we are very careful to keep that segregated and not run that through the mixer where we do our organic mixes. Uh, so if you're organic, uh, we don't have certified organic seed, but we can help you out with non-GMO and non-treated. And then all of our inoculants are OMRI labeled. OMRI approved. It, well, there's one that's the, that new mycorrhiza product, Dale, that we have does not have an OMRI label yet, uh, but we've had no problems getting it um, accepted by the organic certifiers. They just haven't gone through the paperwork hassle of getting it OMRI listed. So, um, yeah. well, we're able to work with organic folks in a pretty good fashion on that. Yeah, one thing I would really strongly, strongly encourage, if you are certified organic, let us know. There's nothing worse than shipping somebody some seed and uh, they plant it and then their certifier throws a flag and and they come back and said, you ship me, you know, seed that wasn't, you know, something that wasn't certified organic said, you've never told us. Yeah. Uh, make sure you tell us. I mean, yeah. that, uh, if nothing else just to get the paperwork pre-started. 
Right, right. And, and like Keith said, you know, 98% of what we, we sell is, is not an issue anyhow. But, you know, I had some guy, well, yesterday, ask for a quote, put a quote, and had uh, some concept-treated sorghum. And uh, he said, I can't use that. I'm organic. I said, you didn't tell me. So uh, make sure you tell. It's a lot better if we know up front. Then after the fact, so so just just it takes one. So on the on the topic of being organic, uh, on the flip side, we get a lot of questions on what herbicides. Well, two twofold. What herbicides can I use on this cover crop? And then second, I you know maybe sprayed Roundup beforehand. How long do I have to wait before I can plant this? I know that's a kind of opening up a can of worms. But what would your <laughs> response be? And uh, Dale, I'm going to give you two minutes. Okay, uh, uh, round, Roundup and Paraquat have no waiting period. You can, you can plan immediately. Uh, Dale, how about Liberty? Is that the same? Liberty is the same, yes. And a lot of people are using Liberty more and more because it, it kills mare's tail very well and it kills Roundup resistant pigweeds very well, as long as they're small and has no residual. Um, and it's safer to the applicator than Paraquat. Um, if you add 2,4-D um, or dicamba, then your waiting period can be very long. I mean, standard rule of thumb is basically a day per ounce of 2,4-D um, and two days per ounce of dicamba. So at normal rates, that can put you out a, a week to two weeks in planning. And so um, I would definitely be planning ahead. As far as herbicides that you can put on a mixed cover crop, depends a lot on the season and the species. If you've got a particular weed issue that you're concerned about, um, just let us know and we'll see what we can come up with. Um, it's a lot better to plan the mix around uh, the need to use a certain herbicide, say you want to control uh, fall panicum or or some, some grassy weed, we might be able to put together a mix that can all tolerate dual metolachlor. So uh, just let us know up front and, and we can work with you and, and uh, kind of design around a mix that could all be tolerant to a certain type of herbicide. Yeah, you're definitely going to give up a lot of diversity options if you want to use something with the residual. It's not impossible, but you're certainly going to be limited on what you can use. We covered this a little bit when we had uh, Ray Ward on. And for those of you that did miss that one, we do have all of our webinars recorded and they're on our website. If you just search for webinars and they're also on our YouTube page. Um, so we did ask Ray this question, but we get it a lot is how much nitrogen or fertilizer will this cover crop produce? And how much do I need to apply in order to get this cover crop started? Oh my, that's that's a loaded question. Uh, but it is one we get a lot. And, yeah. and uh, like so many loaded questions, the answer is it depends. Um, if, if you want maximum productivity out of a cover crop, just I want maximum biomass, I would probably go a mix that is very high in grasses with a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. If, however, you're wanting to stimulate your soil biology, increase your soil health, so forth, and, and do that with a minimum of synthetic inputs, you, the route I would probably take is to include a fairly high level of legumes and inoculate with the biazo. Um, I, you know, that way you can make all the plants in the mix fix nitrogen. And um, as far as how much you get, um, essentially, you can eyeball a cover crop mix, look at the biomass, and every, if you look at the protein content in that biomass, um, each uh, protein 
1% nitrogen equals 6.25% protein. And so if you look at this biomass that's 13% protein, that's 2% nitrogen. So if you convert biomass into that, so if you have uh, two tons an acre of legume biomass, that's um, let's say 4% nitrogen, um, when the bacteria break that down, half of it gets consumed by the bacteria, the other half will probably get kicked out. So you can do the math and figure out about how much nitrogen you get out of that. Um, the, the standard rule of thumb is the microbes eat first and they're gonna eat about half the nitrogen that's in that cover crop. Um, if you're in that carbon nitrogen ratio where legumes are in that 20 to 30 range, about half of the, the total nitrogen content is gonna be available for the next crop. Keith, I didn't, I don't feel I did a very good job of explaining that you fill in the gaps there. Well, it, it certainly it, it depends on a lot of different things. And, you know, if, if your goal is to produce a lot of nitrogen, then you really need to load up on the legumes. And you know what I tell people is the only, the only real way to know is you got to pull a sample, send it in and have it tested. And again, that webinar with Dr. Ward, we, we kind of went through that, uh, how you do that. You know, we, uh, the, the vetch that uh, we were looking at and we did some videos on and we'll have more information down the road about that. But, you know, that came back 224 pounds of nitrogen uh, that was in that biomass. And when Dale and I looked at it, we were, we were guessing lower than that, but it, it really was cranking it out. A lot of mixes, if you have a diverse cover crop mix, you know, that has, you know, 30% legumes and 70% broad leaves of which maybe half of that is grasses, you know, which is fairly typical. It's not uncommon to see 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen if you send that in for a test. That's, that's pretty standard, pretty common. Some of that's being produced by the legumes. Some of that is just being cycled by the grasses, but you're still keeping it from getting away from you. And so, you know, to me, that still counts. That still counts as nitrogen that's going to be available for the next crop. And so, uh, that's that's a pretty decent rule of thumb. As far as the, the fertilizer question, when people ask me, should they fertilize their mix? How much should they put on? Uh, it it, it kind of depends on your goals. If your goal is to graze or to hay and you're going to be removing biomass, then then I think you need to grow as much as you can. And so then I think it is worth some some fertilizer investment. I generally tell people 40 to 50 pounds is probably all you need. You're not trying to produce a grain crop. So you don't have to go crazy on how much nitrogen you put out there because you're not, you know, a lot of the nitrogen you put on a crop is to produce grain. And we're not interested in producing grain, just the forage part. So 40 to 50 pounds generally is sufficient to really make a big boost or a big notice. Uh, but if your goal is to produce as much soil benefits as you can, then like Dale says, you know, stay away from the, the synthetic nitrogens and put, you know, invest three, three and a half dollars an acre in the Viezo and let it go to work and make your cover crop work for you. Um, and so again, it just kind of depends on what your goals are and how much you're going to put out there after it. The other thing with, especially like with the phosphorus, if, if your soils are really low in phosphorus, it may not be a bad idea to put some of that out there for the cover crop because if you're not hauling that cover crop off in a hay bale, that phosphorus is gonna cycle and stay out there for the next crop. So a lot of times what we would do uh, is, is we would put the phosphorus out there in the summer after wheat harvest, let the cover crop utilize it. We know that those, those winter killed summer cover crops are gonna cycle pretty completely by the time the corn is needing it. So we're essentially pre-fertilizing for our corn by putting it out there for the cover crop, but we're letting the cover crop use it first and then cycle and decompose it back through the system. Um, and so we don't feel like that was money that we were attribute an, in, uh, an input investment attributed to the cover crop. It's more for the next cash crop, but we're letting the cover crop use it first and then cycle it back through the system. Right, you're fertilizing two crops with one application and one fertilizer. Yeah. Um, and as far as the crop after the cover crop, um, you know, so much of that depends on the carbon nitrogen ratio of the material and how long it has to decay. 
Um, and uh, a lot of it also depends on how many years you've been doing this cover crop thing. Um, I hear a lot of people tell me that, you know, they, they planted a cover crop and the, the first, the first, very first cover crop you grow, I would not give much, if any, nitrogen credit to it. I mean, you'll get some, but I wouldn't count on it unless you, you were doing some testing and you know where you sit. But once you get the system going, you know, I said half the nitrogen in that cover crop will be available to the next crop. Once you've done this three or four years, you start adding a, a, a half of this cover crop. You know, you'll get half of last year's, you get a quarter of the year before, you get an eighth of the year before that, and a sixteenth of the year before that. The more times you do this, the bigger the pool of organic nitrogen you build up. And eventually, you get to where you have a very large pool of organic nitrogen that you can tap into. Yeah. Uh, on that note, we did have a question was, if you planted hairy vetch and crimson clover at the same time, which one would provide the fastest amount of nitrogen in the spring uh, as far as like when they're terminating? Uh, depends on time of termination. Uh, crimson, where crimson is adapted, it will uh, start fixing nitrogen earlier in the spring, start growing earlier in the spring than the vetch. But it also finishes quicker. And vetch has a higher capacity to fix nitrogen, but goes later to do that. So um, I like the combination of the two. I mean, it's one of the situations where diversity is is a good thing and purple and red together you know kind of a beautiful marriage sometimes like k-state in nebraska dale <laughs> it can work it can work yes <laughs> yeah so, and, and that's 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 assuming that you're far enough south where crips and clover will reliably overwinter yes i think once you get north of i-70 it's hit and miss. Uh, you know, up here where we're at in southern Nebraska, I can say that I probably really only seen crimson clover overwinter well once and overwinter sort of well two or three times and the rest of the years hardly at all. Yeah. Now along I-70, it's more like probably three years out of five and some of the newer varieties of crimson clover, like the Kentucky Pride that we've been carrying, uh, is supposed to be quite a bit uh, more winter hardy, maybe maybe 10 degrees better temperature wow. than the, the Dixie that uh, is the main crimson clover variety out on the market. Yeah, and we're trying to switch over to all Kentucky Pride, but it, there's just not enough of it out on the market right now, so we're we're slowly transitioning over to the better types as, as production uh, comes up on it. Okay, these next ones are uh, more logistical. Um, when people call in, they say, how long is this gonna take me? I need, my, I need to get this planted two days from now. What is a typical turnaround time for us and what does that process look like? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. You know, it's gonna vary. Uh, based on the time of the year. Uh, some times of the year, you know, we can get it out that same day. Uh, other times it may be a day or two. And when we really get into the crunch, you know, our busiest season is probably the two weeks on either side of Labor Day. So kind of from the middle of August through the middle of September, we're really busy. And then, you know, it may be four or five days sometimes that uh, we have internally what we call mixed con levels. <laughs> so you know, it's probably not as serious as a DEF CON level, but uh, we have mix CON levels that, that uh, our mix floor guys are putting out for all the salesmen to see every day. And right now, I think they're at probably one or at zero, which means it's going to either get processed that same day or it might take one day. But, you know, as we get busier, those mix CON levels will come up. And I don't know, Noah, Dale, what, what's the highest mix CON level you've ever seen? Probably a three or four. Yeah, because I know that Mixcon, Mixcon 5 says, get Keith an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, I does. I forgot. I, I think they never had to call an ambulance. For I you. put the little comments on there. If we ever go to MixCon Five, they may be hauling me out of here because that means we're really, really swamped and busy. So, you know, we again, we we really try to pride ourselves on getting a fast turnaround time, um, and and that's important because you know planning these things are very timely, and you have the lead time of shipping in there as well. More often than not, when we have a disappointed customer because the seed didn't get there when it should have, it's because we had some sort of shipping issue. Uh, it's rarely because we couldn't get out, get it out the door in the time frame that we told them that it would be. So, you know, we try to have pretty quick turnaround times. The shipping sometimes can be an issue, um, but you know, that's, you know, th the more lead time you can give us, the better. Uh, but we certainly understand too the fact that sometimes it's difficult to make a decision until you know what the weather's going to do. In regards to shipping, how is that typically figured up? We have flat rate shipping um, across Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. So for those states, uh, we can tell you very quickly what that's going to cost, and we can give you a very close estimate of how long that should take. Now, I say should take because sometimes it should be there the next day, but the shipping company either sends it to the wrong terminal or they miss it or they lose it, and so it takes extra time. Uh, you know, we're always fighting that. So we can tell you what it should be, uh, not always what it will be. When we get outside of the states where we have the nice flat rate shipping, oh, and, and Eastern Colorado, we have flat rate shipping across kind of the that front range area of Colorado as well. We get outside of those areas, it gets a little more difficult. We have to go to other carriers because uh, our local carriers don't have as good a coverage in those areas. And so um, that gets a little dicier, it gets a little pricier. And, uh, you know, we, we quote out four or five different companies all the time and we take the most competitive bid um, on the LTL or the less than truckload stuff. When it comes to large amounts, uh, you know, if you're getting, you know, probably 18, 20,000 pounds or more, then we can start looking at dedicated trucks uh, start to come in cheaper than the LTL rate. And, and those actually are a pretty good deal because uh, those are going straight from us to you and, uh, you know, so it really cuts off a lot of time. It can often save a lot of money and it almost always saves damage. You know, if we ship you 10 pallets, the chances of them all coming through unscathed from the LTL company are pretty rare. They're hard on stuff. And so if we can ship it direct on a truck, uh, that's, that's always the best. And then sometimes we'll put, we'll put routes together so if we have uh, a number of different customers in a geographical region where we can design kind of a loop or a circle and have either one of our trucks or a contract truck drop those off, we can try to build a truckload out of, you know, we can go up to three different stops with a contract truck. They don't like that, but they'll do it. And if it's one of our trucks, we can, we've done four or five. It's not ideal, but we've done that. So again, the more lead time you can give us, the more likely we can find those better shipping options for you. If you call us up and are in a panic and you need it in a rush, uh, then we have fewer options to get it shipped out to you. And it's gonna, and it's gonna cost more. Yeah, and I would encourage everybody, if you've got neighbors that you know are, are also buying from us, rather than us LTL shipping individual pallets to each of you, See if you can get a group order put together. I, I have customers in a number of area that all kind of put their heads together and, and kind of place all their orders at once and, and uh, have it all delivered to one location and then everybody comes and gets it. And, you know, it can save you several hundred dollars by doing that if, if you have a significant sized order. So typically, the, I would say the number one question I get as far as calls go is, all right, I've got the seed. What's the seeding rate? How deep do I need to plant this? There, there's a lot of questions around how to plant cover crop seed. So this one, I, I do want to spend a decent amount of time on. So maybe we'll just piece this up. But um, how do you find the seeding rate or the bushel weight on the cover crop seed that we send out? Okay. 
You want me to handle that, Keith? Or well, I'll handle that first part there. When when you get, and I don't know, I'll, I'll print one out and hold it up here as Dale's talking. But when you get the seed analysis sheet, it's going to say the seeding rate right on there, um, and and that will tell you thirty pounds an acre, forty pounds an acre. And if you can't find that. All you got to do is is take the number of acres that you're doing, the number of pounds of seed that you have, and just do the math, and you'll be able to tell very quickly what your seeding rate needs to be. Uh, setting the drill is going to be a little bit different deal. We are working on, and probably won't be this year, but next year, um, on those analysis reports, it's going to tell you what the bushel weight of your overall mix is going to be. And again, that's not going to tell you how to set your drill, but it's going to be one factor involved in helping you get close and get started. So that's what we're printing out and providing on the papers that we send you. And then once you get that, then you have to actually get that applied to your drill. So Dale, go ahead and, and talk about several different ways that the, the customer can do that. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's, there's no drill setting for, uh, you know, a mixture of oats, peas, vetch, radishes, uh, you know, there just isn't one. And, and so a lot of people are confused, well, how do I set my drill? Well, um, box drills meter out seed, not based on weight, but on volume. And the way we, you know, the, the English system and American agriculture of measuring volume is in bushels. So it becomes important to determine what is your bushel weight. Well, one way of doing that um, is to have one of these handy dandy little bushel weight apparatus. Um, and, uh, you know, you put seed in here and then you just move this little balance and it'll tell you your, your bushel weight. And then you basically find something, you know, similar on your chart uh, of that bushel weight and set your drill that way. And another way of doing it is to mathematically so, uh, calculate. Go ahead, Noah. How much are those? I mean, where do you get those? I We sell them, but how do people get a hold of those? Well, I said, uh, you said it, we sell them. So uh, okay. how much are they? <laughs> I think they're, like, they, Keith? they're like $65. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're a nice investment because you can use those for planting wheat or oats or peas. They'll work for anything. And they're really easy to use. Uh, they're, they're made out of plastic. They're fairly tough, but I mean, don't run over them. <laughs> so, you know, if you got a toolbox or something on your drill, we, we just carry, we have a big plastic toolbox bolted on the back of our drill and, and that just rides back there all the time. And it'll hold up for many, many years if, as long as you're not stepping on it or dropping it stuff like that. So 65 bucks, uh, you just have to request it and we can send it out with the seed. Yeah. You can also uh, kind of do a mathematical calculation of about what your bushel weight is. And Noah, can I share my screen? I can kind of run through. I put about six, seven slides together that kind of goes through the process. Okay, so basically I, I just put an example here of an OP blend. And uh, so you want to convert this to bushels. So let's just say we have a mix, it's 94 pounds of seed per acre, 64 pounds of oats and 30 pounds of peas. How do you set the drill? So uh, let's go through the procedure. So we want to convert that into bushels because drills don't plant pounds, they plant bushels. They plant a certain volume when you set them. Um, so oats are 32 pounds a bushel. So the 64 pounds of oats is two bushels. The peas are 60 pounds a bushel, so 30 pounds is half a bushel. So the total is two and a half bushels. And so you just set the drill to the approximate number of bushels. 
uh, two and a half bushels would be 80 pounds of oats or 150 pounds of peas. You know, two and a half times 32 is 80 for the oats. Two and a half times 60 is 150. Obviously, two completely different numbers, but if you do both those settings, you'll find out they're almost exactly the same drill setting, even though they're dramatically different numbers um, because of the density, the, the completely different bushel weight. Now, I want to stress, this does not replace calibration. And so I'll go through a, a quick calibration procedure for a box drill. And the things you need, something to catch the seed in, scales, and of course, the drill, and, and a means of raising the drill up. If you've got a pole type drill, um, you'll want to have some jacks, a couple jacks to raise it up so that you can spin the drive wheel freely. And so here's your procedure. Um, put the seed in the drill, uh, measure the circumference of your drive wheel. I, I probably should have put a, a tape measure or measuring tape on there as well. Um, whatever your drive wheel, if it's an end wheel or, you know, measure that drive wheel, the distance around it. Then raise the drill off the ground, whether it's three point or, or jacks, uh, whatever it takes to get that drill off the ground so you can spin the drive wheel. Place the tarp underneath the drill, spin the drive wheel. I like to do it a hundred times because it makes the math easier. Um, weigh the seed that's in the tarp, and then you just do the math. Your pounds per acre is, you just plug it into this equation. Your pounds collected on the tarp, and the area is gonna be your drill width. If that's a 10 foot drill, 30 foot drill, times your tire circumference, your length, your width is of course the drill width, and the length that you travel during that calibration is gonna be your tire circumference times the number of times you spun it. And there's 43,560 square feet in an acre. So you just convert that area that you planted uh, to acres and that gives you your pounds per acre. So if, you know, if anybody, you know, th this is going to be posted um, uh, so you can review this later if you need to. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note to yeah. Dale and I have a, a plan here. We're going to try and get a drill calibration video made so that it'll be more in depth and we'll actually probably do that on our drill so that you'll be able to see that. Yeah. And, and, and Dale very likely probably just sold about 50 of those little drill calibrators. Because <laughs> 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 if you want to want to go do all that math, just buy some in 65 bucks. And yeah. uh, for those little deals, it's really quick and simple to use. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I, I used to teach math and people say, well, I, I'll just pay somebody to do this for me in the future. That's, that's what you're doing right there. That, that's what we're doing right there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I found that nobody has time to calibrate a drill, but everybody has time to drive 400 miles to get two more bags of seed on. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So, so it, it's better to calibrate than to run out and be scrambling and scraping for seed later. You're going to show us the bushel weight there, Keith? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, my stupid screen is, I don't think I will be able to do that. Okay. So it's it's on the paper. And when you get your, especially if you're getting a tote bag, if we are shipping that um, and you look in the little plastic holder on the tote, it's going to have your address, the shipping label in there. You have to look behind it to get the seed analysis sheet. And that's where the pounds per acre and eventually the bushel weight for for the overall mix is going to be as well. Um, most of those bags do not have multiple plastic holders. So we have to put both those pieces of paper uh, in that one little um, Ziploc bag holder thing on the tote. Yeah, I want to get to just a couple more questions in regard to planting, but it is 615. So I'm going to also uh, just let the audience know if you guys have questions, go ahead and start putting those in here. Otherwise, I'm going to keep rolling. In yep. regard to planting, 
Um, people will often ask if the seeds in these diverse mixes will separate in the drill and how deep uh, do you plant? Yeah, we get that question all the time. Uh, the, the, the way I answer this, and Dale, you can weigh in on this too, the more diverse your mix is, the less chance Absolutely. that you're gonna have for seed separation. If, if you order a mix and it's peas and turnips, you're gonna have separation from the get-go and it will be a disaster, it won't, won't work. But now if you start adding in, cause you got, you got a large round seed and a small round seed and they're just gonna move past each other really easily. But if you start throwing in oats and buckwheat and rye and sorghum and you know things that have different sizes, different shapes. Basically what that does is it, it, it plugs all of the gaps and it makes it much more difficult for seeds to move past each other in order to separate. And oats is a great one. We, I, sometimes I'll put oats in a mix just to help tie it up and keep it from separating like that because oats is a long narrow shape and it's a, it's a rough seed. And so it, it kind of sticks in the holes and it plugs the gaps and that roughness keeps seeds from moving past it as easily. And it really, it really helps bind the seeds together. Um, so the more diverse you are, the less you have to worry about it. If, if you are, aren't as diverse, if you only have three or four things in there and there's lots of varying sizes or densities, you could have some issues with stuff pulling apart. So then the recommendation that we tell people is, is separation really is a component of how long is it in your drill and how long are you bouncing along? Because if it's just sitting in a bag, it's not gonna separate. It's only gonna separate as it, as it bounces and it moves inside your drill box. So if that's a concern, then put only a little bit in your drill at a time, maybe put enough in there that will take you an hour or two to plan out and then go fill, you know, so fill less at a time and fill more often and you'll have less seed separation there as well. Uh, so we do have some people that have multiple boxes on their drill and we can keep the small seeds separate. Um, I would say we do that once in a while. It's pretty rare. And even people that have the small seed box, once they see how well that stuff really holds together and flows through a drill in a diverse mix, a lot of times they say, ah, it's not worth messing with. Just mix it all together and I'll plant it. So that, that's kind of our answer to how, how do you keep it from separating. Uh, Dale, why don't you talk a little bit about seeding depth? Yeah, um, an, an analogy I have on on the uh, um, this, the diversity reducing the separation. If you take gravel and cement powder, the cement powder will run right through the gravel. But if you put sand in there with the other two, then it all stays mixed. Same way with seed. Uh, as far as depth. Um, when, when all these diverse mixes start getting planting, I, this will never work because some of this seed needs to be at a half inch and some of it needs to be an inch. There's just no way you can make this work. Only one of those seeds is going to come up and it's really been a bit of a much ado about nothing. Um, uh, it's amazing when you take a, a mixture and you plant it, say, at three quarters of an inch. Some of the seeds need a half inch, some of them need an inch. You put them at three quarters inch and everything seems to work. Um, those big seeds kind of break that crust and create a line of weakness that the small seeds can get sunlight earlier in, in that, that crack. Uh, they can get sunlight down here instead of having to go clear to the soil surface. And, and because the big seeds are pushing and creating a line of weakness, the small seeds don't have to do a lot of pushing. And so it, it all seems to work. And we have very, very few instances where we get a complete failure of any one seed in a mix. Dale, would you say, I, would you agree with this? I would say that we have more issues with people planting things too shallow and they either dry out or they sprout and then they die rather than planting yes. it too deep and they don't come up. Yes. Yeah. You know, if, if you're planting turnips by themselves and you plant them an inch deep, I'd expect complete failure. You plant turnips in a mix and go an inch deep. I'd say most of them are going to come up. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd rather in a mixture in, in a monoculture, the rule is there's little seeds. It's better to air too shallow than too deep in a mixture. I'd rather air too deep than too shallow. Yeah. Okay. Um, question here from Tucker says, what do you use for insect control in your large storage units? Nothing right now. We try not to have things in there too long. Um, in on the rare occasions where we do have to carry things over for an extended period of time, uh, it, it is, we have talked, actually talked about trying to use diatomaceous earth on a larger scale. Um, and it's not necessarily that it's so cost prohibitive. It's it's just going to be labor intensive to try to figure out how to get that evenly distributed. I don't know how effective it would be to just go up on top of the bin and sprinkle a bunch in and have it work down. It might work. I'm not sure. Uh, we try not to treat anything with any chemicals. Uh, once in a while, and once in a while, we will have to fumigate a bin with phostoxin or individual totes if we see some insects in there. Uh, but we, that's kind of a last resort type thing. Uh, sometimes we can reclean the seed and, and blow those out. Um, thankfully, we've had very few issues with insects in long-term storage. Uh, we try to do a really good job of keeping things clean and keeping things moved and not holding things over for extended periods of time. Although it does happen, we just try to limit how much it happens. Okay. Um, oftentimes we get questions on terminating as far as if they want to get the full benefit of the cover crop, when should they be terminating? Uh, I know Dale, your answer is already going to be depends, but what is your guys' general rule of thumb as far as how do you plan to terminate your cover crop? Um, well, I mean, it used to be, well, the advice I, I've given historically, anyhow, has been either get it brown and crispy when you plant or to plant green. And uh, it, it's when you, you kill a, a cover crop with herbicide and it's half dead and it's limp and raggy, that's when you seem to have mechanical planting issues. If it's been dead for a week or more, and it's nice and crispy, that's easy to plant into. Um, if you're planting green, that again, the plants are full of water. They're, they're crisp, the, the coulters and everything will cut through it and that's easy as well. Um, it's in between where you have issues. Now, uh, I guess a special situation though um, and there, there's all different kinds of things that can happen uh, in, in any of the above situations. If you kill too early and you get a rain, then you can be stuck there because it's going to take forever to dry out. Uh, whereas if you plant green, you, the plants can be pumping that water out of the profile and dry it back up. Um, but when you plant green, there's some risks involved with that as well. And some of those risks involve um, insect and disease issues. Um, one of those disease issues, if you're planting corn into rye, planting corn green into rye, there can be some transfer of fusarium fungus there that causes root rot from the rye to the corn. Uh, that's been an issue in places. and. Uh, uh, cutworms or armyworms sometimes will transfer from a, especially a cereal grain to uh, corn or sorghum. And so uh, something that you, you might want to keep, keep an eye out for. And there's a reason they say that the farmer's footprint is the best fertilizer. Um, be constantly out there looking for issues. Almost all these issues are rather easy to deal with if you catch them early and can be nightmarish if you catch them late. And, uh, you know, it took us 7,000 years to figure out how to farm with tillage 
and no cover crops in bare soil. We've only been doing this cover crop no-till thing for really about 10, 15 years now, uh, most of us or less. And so there is a learning curve and, and there are a lot of problems sometimes we don't anticipate. Um, and best to, that's one reason why it's good to get on webinars like this and, and uh, get on our website and, and get on discussion groups and learn about what other problems and successes people are having so that uh, you can repeat the successes and uh, head off the problems. This one, I'm not sure if, uh, again, I'm opening up a can of worms with only five minutes left, but uh, we do get quite a few people that want to grow something different, but don't know where to necessarily sell it. So we get asked a lot of times if we purchase cover crop seed ourselves. Uh, Keith, do you want to kind of answer that one for us? Sure. We love buying cover crop seed from our customers because we believe that anything grown in a more regenerative type system is going to be a healthier, more viable type seed. So that's our preference is, is to have as many of our contract growers also be our customers um, because we know that it's going to be a better product. So with that being said, you know, we, we do have, you know, we sell a lot of seed, so we need a lot of seed produced. We do have a lot of customers that are growing seed for us across uh, quite a few different states. Uh, and, you know, it varies a lot. The, the things that are the easiest to grow are probably the cereals. Uh, but that's good because that's what we also sell the most of. And so um, oats, barley, triticale, rye, uh, all those sorts of things. We have large acreages under contract. And uh, those, those are probably the easiest ones to get into simply because uh, you probably already have the equipment that you need to do that. It says it takes specialized stuff. Whereas if you're trying to grow like clovers or radishes or turnips or some things like that, you probably are going to need not only specialized equipment to harvest that, but you're going to need kind of a specialized environment. Uh, the thing that destroys seed quality quicker than anything is getting wet or rained on when it's ready to harvest. And so the best seed growing regions are areas like the Willamette Valley of Oregon where they get a lot of rain from September through about July. Uh, and, and, you know, from July through September, they get hardly anything. So they have a good growing season and then a pretty consistent, very dry period in which they can harvest. Another area we get a lot of seed is the Treasure Valley in Idaho, uh, Boise, Nampa type area. They literally are in a desert. They only get six to eight inches of rainfall a year but they've got lots of irrigation water out of the rivers. And so those make really good seed growing areas for those specialty type crops. What I would say is if you're interested in growing seed for green cover seed, uh, we have a full-time guy now. I used to do it myself and did a terrible job of it because I just didn't have time. Scott Ravencamp is our guy right now that handles all of those contract acres. So if you're interested, you can send any of the sales team uh, that you've been working with an email and just say, hey, I'm interested in growing seed for you guys. Can you connect me with Scott? And, or you can just email Scott directly. It's just scott at greencoverseed.com. And uh, just tell him what you're interested in doing. He, he's he's going to have, you know, he has some fairly high standards. Uh, growing good quality seed is a lot different than just growing commodity grain. And so uh, he'll kind of walk you through some of the different things that we would expect of people that we would require people. And uh, if, if uh, you know, all of those things sound reasonable and workable to you, uh, then he'll continue to work with you and see if we can get you as part of the growing team. So uh, yes, we do that. Um, you know, we have lots of people that are interested in that. So uh, we're trying to select the best growers and also the best locations. We like to spread our acres out, but also keep them as close to here as possible to minimize freight costs, keep the cost down for everybody. Very good. I do have one question uh, that I'll ask you guys here to finish up. But um, as far as my part, thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. Like I said, la uh, next week will be our last webinar. We're going to talk about what to plant. Um, we're going to 
kind of touch a little bit on what to plant into your corn and soybeans after harvest, maybe some inner seed um, and different ways to aerial seed and things like that. Um, that will be next week. So thanks Keith and Dale. My last question for you guys uh, and as well as if you guys have any other last comments is what is the best resource that you guys have to learn more about these topics um, that you would recommend others to look into? Well, I'll go first on that. Um, that that's, a, that's a typical one. You know, we put a lot of time and effort into our soil health resource guide. So I definitely would recommend getting a copy of that if you don't have one or downloading it online and, and reading through that. But really, in my opinion, the best resource right now is YouTube. If you know how to search YouTube, you can literally find anything. Now that doesn't, <laughs> finding anything doesn't necessarily mean good. So it's a little bit like mining for gold. You're going to have to throw away a lot of ore, a lot of rock to, to get the good nuggets. Uh, we've tried to go through and get a lot of those nuggets and curate them on our Green Cover Seed channel. So we've got all these webinars. Dale and I have a lot of videos where Noah's filmed us out in the field talking about these different crops. We're going to make a special emphasis moving forward on trying to do what we call situational learning where we would go out either to a field that's having a problem or a field where we're trying to solve a problem. And we'll just stand there and we'll talk about what we're trying to do and, you know, make a, you know, five, 10, 15 minute video about a particular situation and how we're trying to deal with it with, with a cover crop or a biological solution. So that's what we want to do uh, moving forward. We don't have a lot of those right now. We have a lot of talking about, you know, here's what triticale looks like, here's when you use it. Uh, but we're going to try to do more of those situational things. So uh, I encourage people to enroll in YouTube University and get in there and, and take whatever classes you want. The nice thing about it is if you start one, you don't like it, bail out on it and go find something else. Uh, there's lots of things out there to choose from. Dale? Uh, I would add to that. Uh, I, I would second that um, and also add to that uh, network. I, I think um, – I would encourage you to get to uh, as many in-person meetings as you can and and get to know the people who are doing this stuff. Uh, you know, the greatest, you know, exchange email addresses and phone numbers and chances are whatever problem you are looking at, someone else has faced the same problem and handled it, you know, various ways some successful and some not. So um, knowing who those people are is just gold. And, and that's why I think, uh, you know, one of the best things about this job is I get to go to these meetings and, and interact and rub shoulders with all these people who have walked this walk, you know, as long or longer than I have. And, and you get all these people that farm all these acres. Um, you don't, you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. Like they say, experience is the best teacher, um, but experience comes from, from uh, bad things happening. And, and rather, rather than make those mistakes, you cannot pay, uh, afford the tuition at the School of Hard Knocks. Um, learn from other people rather than having to make those mistakes yourself. And, and so get to know those people. Thanks, Dale. I can't help but think you look like a zebra. I just wanted to make that. I know that the sunlight is coming in and I keep shifting trying to find a place where. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't the only one thinking that. <laughs> hey, well, at first, the sun is coming down and so now it's all over me. So. No, it, you know, Dale brought up a good point. Uh, it's a good segue. Do you want to mention our field days coming up? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, our field day is going to be August 5th and 6th, not like the email that I sent out that said the 6th and the 7th. Uh, it is the 5th and the 6th of August. We're going to do basically the same thing each day. So it's not a two day event. Uh, it's just a one day event, but we wanted to make sure that everybody's safe and we don't have too large of a group. So we're going to limit it to a hundred people each day. There is a free lunch included in that. And we're going to go look at, we've got over a hundred different species planted in our plot. So there's a lot to look at there. And then we also are going to look at, uh, if you've seen the video on YouTube on the weed and feed, we planted uh, green into some rye and vetch. We're going to talk about that as well and look at what we're doing 
more on a large scale on our farm and uh, should be a lot of fun. So if you want to go register for that, I believe we put the link out on Facebook so you can go look at it there. I'll have it posted on the website shortly. So absolutely go ahead and sign up for that. We'd be excited to have you there. Blake, Nebraska that, is a big tourist destination, so come on out. <laughs> <laughs> With that, thank you guys so much. Uh, appreciate you tuning in, and hopefully you got something out of this. We will see you all next week for the finale of season one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.